How's it going everyone? I am Jeremy Alexander and welcome back to another pixel platformer tutorial. So in the last video I had to make a few changes. I moved the tile map down a layer so it was here and I moved it down to here so we now actually have room to jump without being destroyed. And I also took our player and I hit control X and I put it on its own layer called entities. Now this layer is going to be all about our interactable objects. So a sign, our enemies, anything that we want our player to really interact with, even though it is interacting with something on a layer below, this is just going to help organize our actual game. Now there's a bunch of different ways you can set up your layers, but I find that this way works perfectly. I mean, it's really, it's a great way to organize it and I've done it ever since. So basically what you can do now is you don't have to be interfering with your tile map at all. So you can lock the tile map altogether, you can hide the tile map over here, and you just have a little bit more organization. So other than that, I added some, like I added two things of foliage here. I put some flowers and I put a rock there, just part of the tile map for fun. But I think overall, when we get to doing parallaxing, we're going to be redoing this layer, so or this entire level. So don't go too crazy yet. Or you could go crazy and you can probably salvage your work versus mine. So I wouldn't worry too much. We're just trying to get the gameplay done. Okay, so enough rambling on that. What we're doing in this video is we're gonna set up our player animation state engine. And now that may sound ridiculously complicated if you've never done this before, but it's really easy and it's really important that we do it this way from the start, which is something that I learned along the way and I think it is really helpful that we do this now. So what we're going to do is we're going to first set up our animations. I'm trying to fit him right there, perfect. So if we double click, you can see that I've changed my animations a little bit. Let me zoom in. And originally what we had was an ID underscore walk and now what we have is an ID right, an ID idle, and an ID left. Now let me explain how I set this up. All I did was I renamed ID walk to ID underscore right. So this is going to be our right direction. And it's the same exact animation. Then what I did was I right clicked on this and I hit duplicate. And when I duplicated it, I renamed it, the duplication to ID underscore left. So it's the same exact animation facing the same way. Don't actually, you don't have to mirror it here at all. Uh, I think it might work, but I'd rather do it in code anyway. Then what I did was I made a new animation and I called it ID underscore idle. And what I did was I took five, six, and seven. So if this animation, if our walk animation and our sprite cheat is zero, one, two, and three, or one, two, three, and four, I took five, six, and seven, which is supposed to be our jump animation. And I actually just made it into our idle animation because there wasn't an actual idle animation given to us, but I'm sure if you really had the art skills, you could draw one. Otherwise, you could probably just make one yourself and I could actually do that right now, now that I think about it. But all I did was I took this frame, which was five, and then I took frame seven, and then I duplicated frame five again. So now it's just going like this. And that works. And when we set up our jump, maybe we'll want to switch it. And actually, the more I think about it, the more we could just do something a little bit different, like when we can always undo this. So if we have one frame here, we can duplicate the last frame and then we can just select all of this and push it down. And then we can duplicate the first frame and we can sandwich the second frame there. So now we have our idle. <laughs> that actually looks fine. I'm fine with that, but either way works. Whatever just represents that it's idle, you could just have a still image. And now we have three animations set up. So let's exit out of this and let's start our state engine. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to click on our player and we're going to make an instance variable. Now an instance variable is specific to that instance of the object. Hopefully that is self-explanatory, but if you don't understand, I would suggest go looking it up. And what it really means is if I made a copy of this and I gave it a variable, the if I gave the original a variable and then I made a copy, I could change the copy's variable without it interfering with the original. So we could have a bunch of different clones with the same variables but different parameters. So let's make a new instance variable here. Let's call this our player direction. And you know what? We, we don't even have to, well, you know what, let's leave it at player direction for now because if we're doing attacks later on, we might either want to combine it with the direction or make a new one altogether. It doesn't really matter. This is just really for our animation stuff and for me to show you. 
So we're gonna give it a, the type of text and we're gonna give the initial value of idle. And we're gonna hit okay. So now we have our player direction text is equal to idle on this instance of our player. So if we made a copy of this and we changed the player direction from idle to right, then that would be different. So actually let's, let's do that real fast and I'll show it to you. So here's our second guy and we called this one right or do we have to make a clone of it? Nope, we're good. So idle, right, there we go. So that's the power of instance variables. Now this guy's completely different from this guy. So let's delete that copy. And do I have to delete it from my objects? No, we're good. Okay. So if we go into our player event here, we have very simple controls. And I actually had this set up a little bit more, but we can delete that for right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, if the D key is down, then we're going to go into our player. We're gonna set the value of our direction to be quotation marks and to the right. Then what we're going to do is we're going to say, object player, set the animation to equal ID underscore and object player. Now this is how we retrieve the instance variable dot player directions right there and we hit enter so we're saying have our prefix and then whatever our player direction is equal to for our animation and this is what's really important because now all i have to do is copy this paste it and i'm done i have to make sure that i set the direction in between there but i am done so let me set this direction and then i'll go over it again so if a is down we're no longer moving to the right we're moving to the left and there you go, our animation will now be set to the left. And if we haven't done our jump frame yet, but it would be the same thing. So now what's happening is if the D key is down and we're, we're moving to the right, we're setting the player direction to the right, then we're setting the animation ID or setting the animation in general out of all of these animations, which one do we wanna play? Well, we know that we wanna play ID underscore something and we just set this player direction to right, so we're calling it, and now it's going to say ID underscore right. It'll be equivalent to this. So this way we can just copy and paste, and this line of code right here will save you a lot of time in the long run. Now we have one final thing that we need to do, and that is set up for idle. So there's a few ways that we could do this, but in reality what we can just do is we can say, if our, uh, actually, yeah, let's say if our player, and we're gonna go to compare instance variable, is equal to idle, which we know it is by default, then what we can do is we can actually say, do, 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 copy and paste that, just like that. So now it's going to always set it to idle. Now we have a few checks that we have to make, but now it's always going to be set to idle when the direction is idle. So if we hit play real fast, and if it wants to pop up, then you can see here that since it's idle, it's going to be idle. And now that we hold down D and A, there we go, it's actually animating. But now when we let go, we have to fix that. So let's fix that right now. Okay, so to fix it, what we're going to do is we're going to try this. Let's double click. Let's go to our system. Let's type in every tick. And now our every tick is going to be every single frame that the game is running. And so this is actually very important and it's something that I usually like to put in the level event and that way we can have our every tick and our start of frame. But for right now, we can actually, we need this for our player event. So if we did have more every tick events later on, it'll all just combine into one. So it's not that big of a deal. But in our every tick, what we're going to do is we're gonna go into the action of our player and we're gonna set the value of our direction to equal idle every single second. So now, let's actually debug this as well. So now hopefully, when we hit the D key and we let go, it'll set it right back to idle. There we go. Cool, so let's actually, just let me show this to you in the debugger. So we haven't gone over the debugger yet and hopefully you have figured out that that's an option here. You are limited with the free version, but you should be able to see your instance variables. You click on our player object, and now we're gonna scroll down to where our instance variable is. It's kind of different per 
browser and I think per load it's a little bit different every time you launch it, but our instance variable player direction is right here. And right now it's equal to idle, but if I hold down the right arrow key or the left arrow key, you can see that it's changing. Same thing with jump. Now it's changing, and this this is exactly how we need to debug it. And this is what I really do for a lot of things. You want to make sure that your variables are changing, and you want to make sure that things are getting called when they're supposed to. So let's exit out of this, and now let's actually just complete this by mirroring our image. So if our D key is down, we're moving to the right. And if we look at our player, we are facing the right. So we're going to make sure that every time we hit the D key, that we're resetting it to not mirror because it's already not mirrored. So that might not make sense. Let me just do this and I'll explain it again. So if the A key is down, we're going to set it to mirrored because it's going to flip it. So now, even though by default we're facing to the right, we're setting it not to be not mirrored, so it's not going to change at all. But just in case we flipped it and we hit the A key, we're going to set it to mirrored and that way we just have a check to always set it back. A lot of what coding is, is kind of like redundancy checks, and you want to make sure that you have checked off everything. Okay, this is great. So we have our player, which is animating when we hold down the key, and we are being mirrored when we actually hit the right key. Everything is working perfectly fine. We have made our state engine. So thank you for watching this video. In the next few videos, we'll be doing our parallax. We'll probably be redoing our level a little bit. And we will do our jump animation as well. I think we might even be doing that next. So make sure you stay tuned for that. If you did like this and you want to see more, make sure you like and subscribe to my channel. That really helps out a lot. And if you have any comments that you wanted me to implement for this game, please leave that below in this video so I know where to take this game and what you might want to see in it. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.